Well, happy Thanksgiving week to all my friends in the States and to those of you who are not in the United States. I wish you a happy week as well. A joy-filled week is what I pray for you. We're going to wrap up our mentoring series, our Gift of Friendship series, and specifically this, the um, sub title sub subject of um, mentoring under the gift of friendship mentoring part three the gift of friendship mentoring part three Jesus and his disciples well it's been about 16 years since my father-in-law passed away and on his tombstone it read it read it reads leaving a legacy and that's exactly what he did he left a legacy for my husband and therefore for my family because leaving a legacy is way more important than leaving an inheritance. And this is exactly what Jesus did with his 12 disciples. He, the ones he spent the most time with, he left a legacy. He was preparing them the whole time that he was with them to carry out his ministry after he was gone. They didn't understand this, even though he told that to them many times in multiple ways. They just couldn't understand it because they wanted him to be the king that would take over Rome and to change things the way they thought they should be changed. And they did eventually get it. The gospel is the message that we carry. But the ministry or our legacy is how we carry that out. It's the method of carrying that out. So you must be in the message in order to do the ministry. You must be in the message, living out the message, in order to leave a legacy in others' lives. Let's see what Jesus did. Jesus had a different goal with each person. And that's what we've been talking about with mentoring, that you need that every mentoring relationship does not look the same. Even if you're discipling two people and you're teaching the basic core tenets and doctrines of Christianity, how you interact with people is going to be different, or it should be, based on their personalities. So making sure that you have the right person and the right process that matches them just like Jesus did. He was very intentional with the 12. He was very intentional with them. And for some of them, we know exactly what Jesus was trying to do in them or actually try to take out of them, right? He was saying, okay, Peter, that impetuosity that needs to come out. You have some impulses and they're a little too strong at times. For James and John, he he's like probably like, I love your drive, your drive, guys, but self-ambition is not the way to go. Matthew, your materialism, mm, we got to get that out of you, buddy. And Judas, well, poor Judas, what can we say? And so Jesus knew how to develop their strengths and to address their weakness, their character issues, and make them into people of integrity. He did that with the women that followed him, and he did that with the 12 disciples, and the 72, and the 120, and I could go on. And that's really, you see the picture there, that's really what Jesus shows us about mentoring. He shows us to how he is a ripple effect, how we are in the business of not addition, but in multiplication. We're multiplying Jesus and other people. Jesus invested in the 12, not in to 1,200. Because what? More time with less people equals greater impact for the kingdom. I know that doesn't seem like the right math, but that's God math. Nothing, everything is upside down in the kingdom, right? So the more time I spend with a few people, and those people spend time with other people reproducing what I've taught them. And then they spend with other people. You see how the process works. And that's what God intended for us to do. He intended us to do that. And we see that throughout the book of Luke. We're going to start in Luke chapter 5. And we're going to go through a couple chapters, just a couple verses, to show you how Jesus modeled this mentoring process for us. Luke 5 and 6 show us how Jesus invited the disciples to come and they observed Jesus and, and he instructed. They were just with him. 
They were with him at this point. They weren't doing anything. They were following him and they were with him. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 5. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled up their boats on shore, left everything. I want to iterate that. Left everything and followed him. In Luke 5, we see the beginning. Jesus gave them a vision for something bigger than themselves. Don't you want that in your life? Aren't you tired of working for the man and doing things that really, you know, in the end, everything is going to burn up. I want to be a part of something that's bigger than myself. That's something that is part of God's kingdom, which will last forever. Now notice Jesus didn't say here, you will be my evangelistic process and start this off for the whole world to see. And you are the beginning. He didn't say that to them. He said, you're going to be fishers of men. He was meeting them where they were. He was meeting them where they were. So when we mentor others, we promise to prepare them by assuring them and giving them goals. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing here. Let's look at Luke 6. One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Oh, I think he's modeling something here for them. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them. Notice he had already called them in Luke 5. This is almost like a recalling of them, a solidifying of their um, purpose, his purpose for them. So he designated the apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So in Luke 6, what we're seeing is that Jesus taught them how to live, how to relate to each other, and how to win the world. He's pouring into them. He's giving them things. He's saying to them, I see that you are uninstructed or uneducated. I will inform you. Because we know they were fishermen, right? He's saying, I know that you're confused. Simon the Zealot was confused. I will direct you. I'll take that zealot na zealous nature and I will help you to win people for my kingdom. He said, you know, I know you're reluctant. Matthew was reluctant. He said, I'm going to prod you. I'm going to be here with you. I see you, Matthew. I see the potential in you. He encouraged the downtrodden. He was there for them. And he had a variety of people that he was saying, there's a little bit of somebody or something in the rest of the what the world's going to be. If I can use these tw this motley crew, I can use anybody. And that encourages me. That I hope it encourages you today. Jesus saw their potential. He saw them through the eyes of potential and knew what they could do. Even though over the course of the three years as he was mentoring them, it was a roller coaster sometimes, right? Saying to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Say, saying, I don't want you to build a tabernacle up here with Elijah and Moses, all of these things that they still weren't fully realizing. So now let's look at Luke 7 and 8, the next step in the ripple. Luke 7 and 8 is where we see the disciples. They assist and they participate. They were with him in 5 and 6, and now they are helping him. They are going a step further in the mentoring process. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at that. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. This is in Luke 8 specifically. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. 
We didn't read Luke 7, but in Luke 7, if you go back and read that on your own time, you'll see that Jesus was using active ministry. He had called them to be his apostles. And then in 7, he's saying, okay, I'm going to use active ministry. I'm going to start to train you here. I'm going to model for you what I expect of you as my leaders, as the leaders for the kingdom of God. And then in eight, what we just read, we see that he was shaping their perspective, right? He was shaping their perspective and strengthening their souls. He was conforming them to his image. He was changing their mindset now that they had spent time with him and now that they were helping him. He was giving them tasks to do. He was building that relationship. And, and that's exactly what he did. He was talking with them. He was affirming them. He was praying with them. He was giving them jobs and sending them on little tasks at this point, not sending them out without him, but they were. he was sending them to go do something on behalf of him. And that's what he was doing. He was stretching, if you will, like, like we saw last week, blessed are the flexible, right? For they shall not be broken. He was stretching their spiritual stamina so that they would be stretched. That's what he does to us, but only he knows our breaking point and he was stretching them so that they would grow. That's how we grow. We grow when we're stretched. And if we fail, the next time we're stretched, we remember, hey, I could have done it last time. And so we grow in that stretching process. So Luke 9 and 10 show us the next ripple. So they observed and were instructed they were assisting and participating. And now in Luke 9 and 10, we will see that they will follow and they will report back. Basically, they're going and doing without him. Ripple. And that's how we reach more people and more people and more people. Luke 9 and 10. Luke 9, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. Hallelujah. That's still a word for us today. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Sick Signs and wonders follow the word of God. Amen. He told them, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. I know people who live like this right now. Powerful people for the kingdom. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. I love this. I love this. Luke 9 shows us that Jesus equipped them for permanent and independent impact for the kingdom. He said, I am going to delegate this to you. I'm going to communicate how to do this. I am going to motivate you. I am going to use what we have been doing. And now I am going to release you to do it on your own. He was had full faith in them because he had trained them. He had taught them. He had got to the heart of their issues and he believed in them. And I know that that's the case for you. Jesus believes in you. He's waiting on you. And not long after that, when he sent the 12 out, is when he then sends out the 72. And he sends them out in a similar fashion. It almost, it almost just replicates what he said to them. And the 12 were probably included in this group. And they had the opportunity then to pour into others. Let's look at Luke 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus commissioned them to prepare for the coming of Christ. This was his way of expediting, if you will, the mission. He's saying, okay, 
it's my three years is coming to an end. We've been together. We've gone here. We've gone there. We've done this together. You've watched me do this. You've helped me with this. And now I'm not only sending you out, the 12, I'm sending out more because they have been following us. They have been a part of this ripple effect. While you, 12, were assisting and participating, they were observing and being instructed. Oh, while you were doing this, they were coming along and helping. So you see, that's the process of mentoring. And you can, just like Jesus did, you can observe and instruct one while you are letting others help. And while you are doing what we're doing in this one, letting others go, releasing them and letting them report back, being their accountability in whatever area it is. It could be mentoring their marriage. It could be mentoring their parent, parenting. And they come and they report back to you. Did you tell your children you love them every day this week? Did you spend five minutes just listening to your spouse this week? Things like that, growing, helping someone. He knew the hardships that his disciples would face, but he also knew the successes that they would gain because he trained them well. He trained them well, not just their hands, but their hearts. He knew that they would know what to say and how to say it, how to deal with de casting out demons, how to lay hands on the sick, how to preach the word of God. They and because they had a clear vision. Can you imagine when he said that to him? The harvest, it, the harvest is full. There's plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. They probably thought back to that first day when he said, Come, I will make you fishers of men. Now he's saying the harvest field is right, but the workers are few. Come, come and do this. Mentor others because we need more workers in the field. And so they came. He gave them specific feedback concerning their character and their capabilities when they returned. Remember what we learned in our first friendship lessons? Conflict is a part of friendship. Conflict is a part of the process. So we can't be surprised by it. The gospel in and of itself creates conflict. It's always calling people to change. And change does what? It causes resistance, doesn't it? And resistance causes conflict. And that's okay because that's what the gospel, the cross, should do. You're changing the old into the new. You're changing sin into salvation. You're changing brokenness into wholeness. Jesus is changing the downcast into the joyous. All of those things. Transformation is happening. And so it's causing conflict. The enemy is noticing. Satan is noticing. People around that person who's being transformed are noticing. Some of them may be not liking the new person because they're not being able to manipulate them or use them for their own purposes. They're Because they're saying, no, I'm no longer going to do that. I'm no longer going to take drugs. I'm no longer going to be manipulated by you. I belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm moving forward. I have, uh, you want to be my friend? Great. But if you can't be my friend, if, now that I'm following Jesus, there's where conflict happens. So sometimes it is a part of the process. And so as mentors, what we need to make sure is to make sure that we are not the root of conflict, but we but that the gospel is the root of that. That we're not trying to change people by our opinions or by controlling them. That we're allowing the gospel, the gospel, the word of God to change other people. Because if we are in the way, then that is manipulation instead of motivation. And we will be held accountable for that by our mentor, Jesus Christ. So make sure as you're mentoring people that you are doing what we've learned in these lessons and that you are pouring out as God pours into you and that you're following the continuum and that you are doing 
well, what you're going to see next. Here is kind of a, a recap, if you will, of what we've learned over the last three weeks in mentoring. I call it the Ten Commandments of Mentoring. All right, number one, establish the mentoring relationship. The stronger the relationship, the greater the empowerment. So you establish that. You make sure that you start off on the right, on the right foot. You know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and that goes into the next one. Jointly agree on the purpose of the relationship. When you have disappointments in the mentoring relationship, it's usually tracked back to unfulfilled expectations. Okay, so you don't want that. You have to agree at the beginning of the relationship what the relationship's purpose is. And if you have that intimacy, if you have that connection, all of those things that we talked about, all that needs to be established from the beginning. The most important thing is that you know that this is a mentoring relationship that God is saying to do. Okay? Then, determine the regularity of the interaction. S again, set this at the beginning. You're going to hear me say that over and over. You have to have the flexibility and availability for impromptu. Something is going on. There's been a challenge. You're going to be there for your mentee. But make sure that you... Are, have established that from the beginning. We're going to meet once a month for an hour for a year, okay? So you know you have that set in at the beginning. Does that mean that you can't have an impromptu availability? Absolutely not. That builds relationship. That builds intimacy. Number four, determine the type of accountability. This is the heart of mentoring, is not only what the mentor shares with the mentee, but the task the mentor gives. Make sure that the mentee understands that you expect the task to be done and that you prodding them to make sure they do their homework, whatever that might be, that that is done before you move on. And that if they're not going to do their part, you're not going to do your part and the in the relationship might be oh might need to end at the mentoring relationship that is so you want to make sure that those things are established number five set up communication mechanisms how and when to communicate a concern a praise a, a feedback it must be clarified again at the beginning. So when I begin a, a mentoring relationship, I say to the person, if I have a concern or I want to share something with you and it's not our week, how do you prefer that I communicate it to you? And then some people like to get emails or texts so they can read it and ruminate on it and, un and understand it and get clarification. They, they process things better that way. Other people want a phone call and they want to just, whatever it is, challenge or praise, they want to talk about it right then. Sometimes it's, okay, I, we really, if it's just something that came up or whatever, then all right, I'm going to communicate it to you when we're having our meeting. Do you prefer I do that at the beginning of the meeting or the end of the meeting? Things like that. Because people, just like Jesus was intentional with the disciples, people process things differently. And how you as the mentor would do it may not be the personality of the one you are mentoring. Clarify the level of confidentiality. This again goes with personalities. What you see, if you know me personally, or you just know me from this Monday Moments, you see that I'm pretty much an open book, that I'm, I'm transparent about life and, and things. But I've not always been that way. And so uh, what I would have considered confidential, what I consider confidential now and what I would have considered confidential 20 years ago, completely different. So just make sure you're tracking with each other on that. Number seven, set the life cycle of the relationship. Avoid, avoid, avoid open-ended relationships. You don't want to have that. It's not the mentoring process for that, for you and a specific individual is not supposed to last forever, okay? It's not supposed to. Mentoring isn't supposed to last forever. Just like counseling isn't supposed to last forever. And so set realistic time limits with exit points. 
Number eight, evaluate the relationship from time to time. Wise mentors will use the three measures of accountability, of intimacy, of responsiveness, that's four, and of tra attraction, that's another word, interchangeably with intimacy. You'll evaluate those to, un to um, assess the ongoing journey of your mentoring relationship. This is useful in the fact that maybe you have established that at the beginning that you were going to um, mentor someone, that, that you were going to mentor them every other Tuesday for six months. Well, you realize after the first month that it's not, they don't have the time or maybe you don't have the time it's, or just the process that, you know what, you're going to have to take it back to one month. Not a big deal, but make sure you're evaluating and assessing that. And that is the mentor's responsibility. Number nine, modify expectations to fit real life mentoring situation. That kind of goes with what I just said because expectations are at the root of the most disappointing relationships, no matter what kind of relationship it is. If you're married to someone, you understand that. Unrealistic or unfulfilled expectations are the root, which usually goes back to miscommunication, are at the root of most of those disappointments. And number 10, bring closure to the mentoring relationship. Begin with the end in mind. Um, a uh, mentoring relationship is basically vertical. Remember how we talked about that last week? You have the horizontal side, you have the vertical side, you have your Pauls and you have your Silas's and you have your Barnabas's. Well, mentoring is a vertical relationship and vertical relationships are not supposed to last forever, okay? Because it goes back to what Jesus showed us and the ripple. This relationship it's of being mentored, you reproducing your life in someone is supposed to then lead to them reproducing and the then the people and the process continuing. And that takes us to Luke 24. Luke 24 shows us reproducing, Jesus letting them go. He released them before, but now he's saying you are ready. You are ready to reproduce my life in other lives and to continue to do this. And that's exactly what they did. Let's look. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. All those things he had been telling them. They're saying, oh, light bulb, I got it. Oh, why? But this is after he, this is after he's been crucified. So they're really being able to receive things. He told them, this is what was is written. The Christ will suffer and will rise from the dead. On the third day, he said to them, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Hallelujah. Beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You've been with me for three years, in other words. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed on with power from on high. Luke 24 shows us Jesus empowered them to carry on the mission. He had already equipped them. He had already instructed them. He had already let them participate with them. And now he's empowering them. He has to go away so that the Holy Spirit will come. And he's empowering them to carry on the mission. And they're willing, even though they're sad, they're willing to, uh, to do this. To say, I know you have to go so that the helper can come, the advocate can come, so that we can carry on the mission that you have trained us for, that you have called us to. And they did that. They did that. We're here today as disciples because of the first disciples 2,000 years ago. And this is really important because we teach what we are. We teach what we, I'm sorry, we teach what we believe, but we reproduce who and what we are. I can teach a lot of things that I believe, but life change, reproduction in other people happens when I live out, like Jesus did, model what I believe and who he is in my life personally. 
And you know what? Although God in his grace might use us in spite of ourselves, thank you, Jesus, in spite of all my failures, we normally cannot impart to another person what we do not possess. I can't give you something that I don't really truly have. And so think about that as you are going through the process and thinking about mentoring someone, be in the word, as we said at the beginning of this lesson, this Monday moment, you have to be in the word in order to have the method of leaving a legacy, doing the ministry. They go hand in hand. Because the more that we know Christ, the better we can make him known. I know him better today than I did 15 years ago, and I hope that I'm able to better make him known because of that because that is a timeless principle. It's just like the farmer reaping what he or she sows. And um, spiritual nurture is one of those things. It's related to our own spiritual formation. I can only impart what I already possess. Even Jesus had a difficult time doing this, transitioning his followers in this message right here to carry out his message and his mission. He's saying this to them. He's giving them the, the great commission, He's tell, which was in Matthew 8, 28. And he's saying, wait for the Holy Spirit. He's going to come and don't leave Jerusalem until he does. That's what it says in another, and in Matthew's gospel. But they they still, it was still in the process of getting it because what do they say to him? In this part, they say to him, and we didn't read it, but they basically say to him, John, the apostle Jesus loved, admitted that Peter and his brother James and John himself went back to fishing even after Jesus was resurrected. Process, conforming to the image of God. Sometimes we have to offer additional assistance to others, but we have to do that as mentors without getting in the way of what Jesus is doing in them. Because ultimately, he is the one who changes them. We're just the helper. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is the changer. Okay? So don't take ownership of someone or they will end up manipulating them and trying to control them. And that's not what this is about. Christ promised to empower them and to be with them to the very end of the age, Matthew 28. 11 plus 1 made them so invincible that again, we are here today because they walked in that empowerment and they carried on the mission of Jesus Christ. And the world has never been the same. That was the Lord's pattern for then, and that's still the Lord's pattern for now. He gives his church a task so great that it requires their all-out best efforts, my all-out best efforts, anything and everything I can do for him, with a wholehearted dependence on him. That's the divine synergy of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's you. It's him, divine synergy, reproducing your life and to another person's life. Mentoring is bigger than you, but it's expected of you. Yeah, there is someone waiting for you to come alongside and help them. Help them in their marriage. Help them um, in their parenting. Help them be a better disciple. Help them at the workplace. Someone is waiting for you. And think about it. Someone took a chance on you. That's why you believe in Jesus. So take a chance on another. Be that in another person's life. Follow the Ten Commandments of mentoring so it's a successful and it's set up to be a good um, process for both of you because that's the greatest thing about mentoring is not only are you reproducing and um, pouring into someone else's life but as you're pouring into their life you're desperate for Jesus to pour into your life and you're changing at the same time that's why I love teaching because I learn as much when I teach than you know than the uh, probably more than the people that I'm teaching it's just the way that it is 
So let me um, end with this. Jesus wasn't looking for achievement. We know Jesus wasn't looking for achievement, obviously. And he wasn't looking to do great things for himself. He wasn't looking. He wasn't like, oh, I'm here. Everybody stop. He wasn't looking to do great things for himself. He wasn't looking for success, even though he empowered others to do great things with him. We saw that. They were with him. And though he was significant, he wasn't looking for that as his disciples did great things for him. They were with him. They did things for him. And finally, he was looking to leave a legacy so his disciples would do great things without him once he ascended and the Holy Spirit came. We can do that. We have the power of the living God inside of us. And he has promised that he wants to do greater things in us. And he's called us to do that. He's empowered us to do the same mission that James, Peter, John, Bartholomew, James, son of Alphaeus, that they had all done. That's what we're called to do. He did it without writing a book. He did it without building a school. He did it without forming an organization. People were his method, and they continue to be that. People should be our method. We can sprint, we can spread the gospel faster with technology and organizations and all the tools that we have in the 21st century. But the method is still the same. Pouring into people so that they can pour into, into others. That's what, he, that's what Jesus modeled for us. That's what it's all about. One fallible human being, me being the first, carrying the message of Jesus to another fallible human being. Not being perfect, but showing that Jesus lives in me. He's changed me and he wants to do the same for you. Someone took a chance on you. Take a chance on someone else. Love one another. Amen. Well, I'm going to be taking a few weeks off. I'm going to have a sabbatical for Monday moments for the holidays and to help take care of my new grandbaby. But um, I will be back in January and I will be fully charged, ready to share with you whatever God lays on my heart and the lessons he lays on my heart while I'm studying for these next couple weeks over the holidays. And um, it's ready to share that with you and also to share about um, upcoming trip to to Kenya and Uganda in the early summer and a trip to Costa Rica in the later summer. So be praying for that, be praying about how you can be a part of that by praying, by giving, even by going, going with us. And I appreciate all of you. Many blessings to you. Happy Thanksgiving again and a very Merry Christmas as you celebrate the Savior, the light of the world. Amen.